Good to see all of you. If you have a copy of God's Word, I'm going to invite you to take it this morning and open to the New Testament book of Hebrews. And we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 1 this morning. Hebrews chapter 1. If you're a guest with us today, my name is Andrew. I'm the pastor here at Paramount. And one of the things that we do as a central part of our worship week in, week out is to open up God's Word um, because we believe that the Bible is God's Word. It is inspired by God. It is truth. And uh, it is what we need today. And so we take books of the Bible and we just walk through verse by verse through that uh, book. We alternate between New Testament and Old Testament. And uh, this morning we are in the book of Hebrews. While you're turning to Hebrews 1, let me just mention one thing. Ask you to be praying as a church family about this. Um, You know that we have had a couple of mission partnerships over the last five years. Uh, One nationally, you just saw a video from Chris Phillips. We helped start Journey Point Church in Denver. Which, by the way, what a stunning stat that he just gave. One church for every 32,000 people, one marijuana dispensary for every 2,000 people. I mean, that was mind-blowing. Um, but they're, they're, uh, we've, we've planted that church. God has done some wonderful things, continues to do some wonderful things through Journey Point there in Denver. And then uh, because we're live streaming, I'm not going to say where we have been, but we've also had a mission partnership in the Middle East. And so we've gone multiple times uh, uh, back and forth to the Middle East in that mission partnership. What I'm, what I'm telling you is uh, next year, both our uh, national and our international partnerships in those areas will be coming to a conclusion. Uh, we committed to those areas for a set period of time, and that period of time is coming to a conclusion. Those have been great mission partnerships, but we are now beginning to think through and pray where God would send us next. And so that's why I'm asking you to be praying. Uh, pray together with us. Our missions committee is going to be meeting very soon to be uh, talking through uh, just different international possibilities for international partnerships, different cities in the United States where we may want to plant another church. Um, the need is great. The need is great. And we want uh, the Lord to give us direction and unity in, in those things. So just be praying that the Lord would give us uh, a vision for that. Uh, we've uh, been praying, uh, literally asked our missions committee to take an, a, a map of the world and just pray over that map and just say, God, where do you want us to go? And uh, I think that the Lord is going to show that to us, and I'm excited to share that with you over the next few months uh, and see where, where it is in the world that God will send us next. So be praying together with us in that. Well, we're in Hebrews chapter 1 this morning. I want to read the text through, and then we're going to come back and uh, talk about it verse by verse. So let's look together at Hebrews chapter 1, and I'm going to begin reading uh, beginning in verse 4. It says, so he, that is referring to Jesus, so he became superior to the angels just as the name he inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now, verses 5 through 14, the author of Hebrews is going to just quote Old Testament passage after Old Testament passage to talk about Jesus and the angels. So let's look at verse 5. For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father? Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. Again, when he brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. And about the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his servants a fiery flame. But to the sun, he says, your throne, God, is forever and ever. And the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of justice. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. This is why God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy beyond your companions. And... In the beginning, Lord, you established the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like clothing. You will roll them up like a cloak. They will be changed like clothing. But you are the same, and your years will never end. Now, to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? Are they, that is the angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve those who are going to inherit salvation? 
I've told you that one of my favorite authors is C.S. Lewis, and he wrote a fiction series uh, that many of you have read called The Chronicles of Narnia. And uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, it's almost a, an allegory uh, for the Christian faith. Um, and one of the, the books that Lewis wrote is a, a book called Prince Caspian. And uh, the little girl, Lucy, uh, comes and meets Aslan, who is a lion. He's the king of Narnia. And when Lucy sees Aslan, it's been a number of years since she's seen him, she, she looks up into his face and he looks down at her and welcomes her and, and she looks at him and she says, Aslan, you're bigger. And he said to her, well, that's because you're older, little one. And she said, well, not because you are? And he said, I, I'm not. But every year that you grow you will find me bigger. Now, Lewis wrote that to give us a little analogy, a little illustration of something that is true in our faith. And that is that a sign that you are growing spiritually is that you see Jesus as bigger. That the more you grow in your walk with Christ, the bigger Jesus seems to you. And that's really the theme of, of the book of Hebrews. The author of the book of Hebrews is writing to a group of recently converted Christians. These are new believers who are facing persecution and opposition because of their faith, and they are in danger of shrinking back, of turning away from Christ. And the author of Hebrews is writing to these believers to encourage them to press on in their faith because they see Jesus as big. And so the whole theme of the book of Hebrews is to show that Jesus is big, that he is great, that he is superior, that he is better than anything else. And we see that in the very first paragraph of, of the book of Hebrews. In chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, the author is arguing that Jesus is bigger and better than the prophets. And that's a pretty big statement. The prophets are really great. The prophets are the ones that God gave his word to, to deliver to his people. And the author is saying, as great as the prophets are, Jesus is even greater than that. That's an important word for our Muslim friends. When we uh, talk with our, our Muslim brothers and sisters and we talk about who Jesus is, they will gladly affirm that Jesus was a great prophet. But as Christians, we believe that Jesus was more than a prophet. We believe that prophets deliver the message but Jesus is the message. We believe that prophets point to God. Jesus is God. And so he is more than a prophet. And that's the first paragraph in the book is just to say Jesus is better than the prophets. Now, when God delivered messages to his people, like in the Old Testament, if he, if he, delivered it, uh, if he did not deliver it through a prophet, he would deliver it through who or whom? Angels, right. So prophets and angels were, were the ones that God delivered his word to his people through. So in chapter 1, verses 4 through 14, the author of Hebrews is going to extend his argument. And he's going to argue not only is Jesus better than the prophets, he's also better than the angels. And so that's what verses 4 through 14 are all about. It's to show us that Jesus is superior. He is higher in rank even then, the angels. Now, <clears throat> there is a fascination in our culture with, I would say with the supernatural in general, um, but particularly angels. How many of you have ever seen a show called Touched by an Angel? Anybody seen that show, Touched by an Angel? Uh, we have, uh, if you go to a Christian bookstore, you might see uh, paintings of angels or maybe figurines of angels. And usually they're these little cute, chubby uh, babies, you know, with, with bows and arrows that go around and shoot people and make them fall in love, that kind of thing. And <clears throat> we, ha we have kind of a fascination with, with angels in our, our culture. Uh, and we have a lot of kind of weird beliefs about angels as well. And this shows up a lot of times like at funerals. When I do a funeral, I hear all kinds of interesting things. Uh, somebody will say, well, you know, heaven uh, got another angel. Or someone finally earned their wings. Okay, so you've heard this before, right? By the way, the Bible doesn't ever say that when you die, you get wings and become an angel. In fact, you won't become an angel. An angel is a very distinct being, a different creature than a human. 
And uh, in fact, we'll see even in this text that angels serve humans. And so uh, just uh, think about that next time you're at a funeral. Heaven didn't gain another angel. Nobody get, uh, earned their wings. But these are the kinds of things that you hear. There's sort of this folk theology about angels that kind of exists out there. I'll never forget uh, the first church I pastored in direct Texas. I did a funeral for a gentleman, and his widow came up to me after the service, and she had this little stone angel figurine. And she, uh, like, very solemnly uh, and very formally, like, presented this fi angel figurine to me. And she said, well, this was, uh, this was Joe's guardian angel. And he doesn't need it anymore. And so I think he would want you to have it. it and now it can protect you. And I thought, lady, I don't want that. Joe's in the box. It didn't do a very good job. <laughs> But we got to have this weird, we have these weird beliefs about angels that kind of show up in, in moments in uh, the life of the church. And, and more broadly, there's a fascination just with the supernatural. So we're fascinated by angels. We're fast, fascinated in our culture by the demonic. Uh, we're, we're fascinated by spiritualism and supernaturalism. I mean, how many uh, vampire novels and sort of like, angsty teenage vampire movies um, exist out there, the TV show Supernatural, and, and so on and so forth. And so there is this interest. Um, I think there are a couple of, of dangers when it comes to, um, it comes to this, when it, when it comes to thinking about the supernatural and, and particularly thinking about angels. One is to ignore the reality of the supernatural. So that's a real danger, and it's a danger in our culture. There's a, a heritage here in the last couple, of, couple hundred years in American culture of uh, what you might call a naturalistic or materialistic worldview. That means that there's nothing beyond what you can see or feel or touch. Um, that that the, the universe, you know, Carl Sagan, some of you may remember the old TV show he used to do where he would say, you know, the universe all there is, is all there is, all there ever was, all, all there ever will be. It's sort of this idea that the only things that are real are um, the material things, the stuff of, of this world, that there's no supernatural reality, that there's nothing more real beyond what you can see. And so there's a tendency for some people to say, well, there's no such thing as demons or there's no such thing as angels. And to deny that actually reveals an atheistic worldview. Uh, the idea that we don't believe in supernatural realities. And the Bible is full of angelic appearances and demonic activity. And the Bible is very clear that we don't live in sort of like a closed universe system, that there is something more beyond the, the material universe. And so we don't want to fall into the danger here of sort of denying the angelic or denying the reality of the supernatural. But on the other hand, the other danger would be to be overly fascinated with it. And I do think that that is a tendency, particularly with, with well, it's really not categorized by generation because I, can, I see older folks who are like really fascinated by angels, but I also see younger folks who are oftentimes fascinated by demonic things. And so there is an over-fascination sometimes with the supernatural in our, in our culture. And what I'll tell you is that there are several dangers in an over-fascination, particularly with the angelic. Um, number one, you may be encountering, if you think that you're encountering an angel, you may be encountering what you think is angelic, but is actually demonic. Um, if an angel appeared to me on the foot of my bed tonight and started talking with me, okay, if, after I pinched myself, made sure I was awake, and thought about what I ate last night for dinner... If, if an angel started having a conversation with me and said something like, Jesus is not God, that would be demonic, not angelic. Um, and so just because you encounter something that maybe you think is an angel doesn't necessarily mean that it's angelic. It might be demonic. Satan himself disguises himself as what? An angel of light. Uh, that's why the Apostle John says to test the spirits. It is possible to be led astray by demonic spirits who are appearing as if they are angelic 
spirit. So what I'll just tell you, and this is a good word for, for everyone in the room, not everything that is spiritual is godly. Not everything that is spiritual is of Christ. And so we want to be very careful to not to have an over fascination with angels. The second danger would be that we may inadvertently, if we encountered something that we thought was an angelic being, we may inadvertently attribute an element of worship that belongs to God alone. Uh, Like, let's be really clear what we mean when we're talking about angels. We're not talking about these sort of chubby babies that shoot arrows at people. In the Bible, when you see angels, these are fearsome creatures. They're they're something like... uh, warrior beings. Um, They they are terrifying. Uh, Scripture uh, uh, makes them seem very large, very scary. They're often portrayed as warriors. When angels appear in the Bible, people bow. And the angel has to say like, get up, don't worship me, Uh, don't die, (laughs) like things like that. Like these are awesome creatures, truly full of awe. And People in the Bible are tempted to worship angels when they see them, which, which that gives us a warning that if we encounter something that we think is angelic, we want to be careful not to be overly fascinated by it because we may be tempted to attribute worship to an angel that belongs to God alone. Now, in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 4 through 14, the author is fully affirming the reality of angels. But the author of Hebrews is contrasting angels with Jesus to show that as great as angels are, Jesus is better. As big as angels are, Jesus is bigger. And so this morning, we're going to talk about four reasons that the author of Hebrews gives us for why Jesus is better than the angels. Angels are great, but as great as they are, Jesus is is greater. And here's why. Okay, let me give you four reasons. Number one, the author tells us that Jesus is better than the angels because Jesus has a better name. He has a better name. Look at what he says in verse four. So he, that is Jesus, became superior to the angels. Why? Just as the name that he inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now, what name is he referring to here in the immediate context? Anybody have an idea? The Son. That's right. In fact, we don't even see Jesus' name mentioned until chapter 2. All the only way he's referred to in chapter 1 is as the Son. You see it in chapter 1, verse 2. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. And then if you look down at verse 5, for to which of the angels did he ever say... You are my son. Today I've become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. So the name repeated three times here in the first five verses. The name that Jesus has inherited is the name of son. Now, he's saying the name son is greater than the name of angels. The word for angels in Greek is angelos. It sounds a lot like angel. And it simply means messenger. That's what an angel primarily is. An angel is a messenger from God. And that's pretty cool. It's a big deal to be a messenger, to be an angelos, to be an angel. But as great as that is, the son is greater. Angels are servants. He is the son. Angels have a good name, messenger. He has a better name, son. His name is superior to theirs. Angels are subjected to God. Jesus is God's very son. You know, names are important. Uh, Names can can cause you to think and feel things that almost nothing else can. Uh, we, We learned this whenever we were naming our four kids. Me and Amy would talk through all these different names. You know, we went through all the Bible names, first of all, Methuselah and Melchizedek, and none of those worked out. And uh, then we started working through other names, and uh, we, one, of a, one of the other of us would mention a name, and sometimes the other person would shoot it down because it reminded us of somebody we didn't like. Anybody been there? Okay. Like, we can't name her that. That reminds me of that meanie back in high school, you know, and I can't call my kid that. Names evoke things. I can, in fact, I can evoke all kinds of feelings from you right now just by the mention of certain names. Try not to say anything out loud here, okay? 
Donald J. Trump. Okay? Joe Biden. I can, I can get you to think some things, and I don't want to know what they are, one way or the other, just by the mention of a name. Kim Kardashian. Don't roll your eyes back there. Justin Bieber. Oh, my word. Okay. I told, you will not believe me when I say this, but in the 830 service, I told the senior adults, when I say Justin Bieber, there's going to be some girl who faints on the second row. I can evoke all kinds of feelings just, just with a name, right? <clears throat> when I think about the name Amy, that brings a smile to my face. How about the name Jesus? There's something about that name. Philippians 2 says he has the name that is above every other name. Think, think about all the names in the New Testament that name the Son. Redeemer, Deliverer, Healer, Savior, Conqueror, the Righteous One, our Advocate, Son. He has a better name. And so he is better than the angels because he has inherited a, a, a better name, a name better, superior, higher in rank than theirs. Here's the second reason. Why is Jesus better than the angels? Well, number one, he has a better name. Number two, because angels worship him. Isn't that what the text said in verse 6? Again, when he brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Here's the deal. If that which you are tempted to worship, worship him, you ought to worship who they worship. Right? If angels are so awesome and so powerful that when they make appearances in the Bible, people just fall flat on their faces, if that kind of creature bows the knee in worship to Jesus, then we ought to worship Jesus. Amen? If you see a creature so awesome that you are tempted to worship it, look at the one that they worship. How much more awesome must he be than they? Think about this. When angels appear, people bow. When Jesus appears, angels bow. And so Jesus is better than the angels because angels worship. Jesus. He has a higher rank, a superior place, and, and the angels recognize that, which means if you're tempted to be fascinated with angels, it's better to be fascinated with the one that fascinates angels. Angels are fascinated with Jesus, so let's be fascinated with him. It's really interesting. You know, uh, the book of uh, First Peter chapter 1 talks about the fact that we as believers get to enjoy the gospel which is something that the angels long to look into. That, that phrase has always fascinated me. How do we experience something that the angels are curious about? You know what we experience? Redemption. Angels don't understand that. There's no redeemed angels. You have fallen angels, but you don't have angels who are redeemed. In fact, Hebrews chapter 2 tells us that Jesus came to redeem us, not the angels. And so we experience, as believers, redemption. We experience the gospel, something that angels are curious about. They long to look into this. They are fascinated by the gospel. They are fascinated by the God of the gospel, which means that instead of drawing our attention to angelic figurines and beings and things of this sort, we ought to be fascinated with the one that fascinates them. Amen? He is elevated in place above them. I mean, if you think about the kinds of creatures that exist in our universe, like angels would be sort of at the top of the pile in my mind, right? Like I wouldn't want to wrestle an angel. Um, they're, they're pretty amazing creatures. Actually, Psalm 8 says that the pinnacle of creation is actually not angels, it's humans. But, but Jesus is above all of those things. He is elevated in place. He has superior rank, and the angels bow and worship to him. If they'll bow to him, we should bow to him and worship as well. And here's a third reason. 
Number one, Jesus is better than angels. Number one, because he's got a better name. Number two, because angels worship him. Number three, because angels serve as ministers, but Jesus rules as king. Jesus is better than the angels because angels serve as ministers, but Jesus rules as king. Look at what the text says here in verses 7 through 9. Uh, the author is going to quote Psalm 104 in verse 4. Look at verse 7. It says, about the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his servants a fiery flame. Now, <clears throat> the, the, the book of Hebrews here is quoting Psalm 104 verse 4, but it changes the word order just slightly. If you actually look back at Psalm 104 and verse 4, it actually makes the, the meaning of this verse a little bit more clear. Psalm 104 4 reads this way, that he makes the winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants. You have two metaphors right there. What are the two images that the, the verse gives us there. Wind and fire, okay? Commentators say that this may refer to the way angels look. If you think about fire, flames of fire mixed with wind, if you've ever seen those dust tornadoes that happen out here in West Texas, imagine flames that are sort of being whipped up by the wind. Commentators say this may be a hint at what an angel looks like. But the psalm says that God makes these fiery angels, he makes them messengers and servants. Now, that tells us what uh, an angel's job is. If you looked at an angel's job description, the, the vocation of an angel, what an angel does is that they are ministers. They are servants of God. We know from other places in Scripture that they are surrounding God's throne, right? In Isaiah chapter 6, you have this picture of angels that are, that are surrounding the throne of God. If you read the book of Revelation, you find uh, angels in heaven worshiping God. And so we know that angels, one of their jobs is to minister to God, to serve Him. Um, so he can send them on assignments. He can give them messages to deliver his, to His people. They can do all kinds of things, and they, they worship Him. But what's interesting about angels is that not only do they serve God as ministers, the text actually tells us that God sends them to minister to us as well. Angels are actually used by God to minister to God's people. And you see that if you look down at verse 14 uh, of Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews 1, 14, it says, Are they, that is referring to the angels, are they not all ministering spirits? sent out to serve those who are going to inherit salvation? Now, who, who are the people who are going to inherit salvation? You won't offend me if you talk, okay? Talking in church is a good thing, all right? So who are those who are going to inherit salvation? Us, believers, right? So the text is telling us that God sends his angels as ministering spirits to serve us. Now, that's really fascinating, and this is probably beyond my pay grade in terms of what that actually looks like. What does it mean for an angel to serve us? But let me just point you to one passage in the Old Testament. There are a lot that we could go to, but let me uh, read to you Psalm 91. You may want to read this later, but Psalm 91 in verses 11 and 12 tells us something about this. Psalm 91 verse 11 says, He will give his angels charge concerning you to protect you in all your ways. They will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. So this tells us in Psalm 91 that God actually sends these messengers, sends these angels to serve and protect God's people. Now, does that mean that we all have guardian angels? Well, the Bible is actually not that specific. The Bible doesn't say that like when you're born that he sort of assigns you know, Leo the angel to you to kind of protect you. If he did, I would probably need more than one just to protect me the way I drive and so forth. Not to protect my foot from hitting a stone, but my foot from hitting the gas. Um, the Bible doesn't tell us, though, that each and every one of us has like a guardian angel. Um, but it does tell us that God 
uses angels to serve us, to minister to us, uh, to protect us even. You remember that when Jesus was tempted in, in uh, the wilderness for 40 days, that angels were ministering to him. When he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, angels were ministering uh, to him. Uh, you have examples uh, like in Hebrews. The book of Hebrews says that when you as a believer show hospitality to someone, that some of you may even entertain an angel without being aware of it. Think about Abraham, when Abraham uh, welcomed in the stranger. He thought it was strangers. Turns out it was angels. So again, how all of that works, I don't know. But the Bible tells us that angels serve as ministers. They minister to God, and God uses them in some way to minister to his people. But now, notice the contrast in Hebrews 1, because the author says that while they serve as uh, messengers as they are God's servants in Hebrews 1, 7. Look at the contrast in verse 8. But to the Son, okay, notice the contrast here. But to the Son, he says, your throne, God, is forever and ever. Now, I'm telling you that Jesus is better than the angels because while angels serve as ministers, Jesus rules as king. That's the contrast the author is making here. He's saying God uses these windy, fiery beings to serve, but in contrast to being a servant, God seats His Son on a throne. Look at all the kingly language that we have in verses 8 uh, all the way down through verse 13, right? If you think about a king, kings are anointed, they sit on thrones, uh, they hold scepters, sometimes they have elaborate footstools, People bow at their feet. Look at all of the language of, of, of kingship here. But to the son, he says, your throne, O God. He sits on a throne. It's forever and ever. And the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of justice. So he has a scepter. Verse 9, uh, God has anointed you with the oil of joy beyond your companions. That anointing, that is kingship language. You remember when God picks David to be uh, the king of Israel and the prophet Samuel comes and he looks at all these impressive brothers that David has. There's some that are taller. There are some that are more handsome. There are some that are better fighters. There's some that would naturally speaking make a better king. But he gets to David and this is God's king for Israel. And what does Samuel do with him? Anoints him. Here, the author of Hebrews says that Jesus, the Son, is anointed. That's kingly language. He even has a footstool, by the way. Look down to verse 13. Now, to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? He's not ever said that to an angel, but he has said it to Jesus. Jesus sits on a throne. He holds a scepter. He's been anointed as king. And one day his enemies will be made his footstool. That's the point that the author is trying to make, is that Jesus is king. He rules as king. The angels are great. They serve as ministers, but Jesus is better because he rules as king. And by the way, he's not just any normal kind of king. He's a divine king. And I don't want you to miss this because <clears throat> right here in Hebrews 1 and verse 8, you have one of the clearest references in the Bible of the deity of Jesus. Look at what's happening in verse 8. To the Son, he says, your throne, God. On a Saturday morning, if you get a, somebody who knocks on your door, and they're wearing a white shirt and a black tie, and they're wearing a backpack, and they say, hey, we're witnesses of Jehovah, and you engage with them in conversation, and they say, Jesus great teacher, great man, great moral example, but he's not God. Will you take that individual to Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8? Because in Hebrews 1, 8, God calls Jesus God. And if God the Father can call God the Son God, then we better call him God. By the way, here's the answer. When somebody says, hey, I'm a witness of Jehovah, you can say, hey, great, me too, and his name is Jesus, Okay. This is a divine king. Jesus is not a normal king. He is God himself. God the Father looks at God the Son and addresses him as God. And God the Son is the one who is enthroned. And listen, because he is God, he is king. 
Because he is God, he rules over all of creation. And if the rightful divine ruler over all, is ruler over all of creation, then he is the rightful ruler of your life and my life. If he rules as king over all things and angels submit to him, we should submit to him. Right? One day, Philippians chapter 2 tells us, one day every knee will bow in heaven and on earth to Jesus. Angels will bow. Skeptics, atheists, agnostics will bow. You will bow. So better to get in the habit of bowing now. Amen? Jesus is better because he rules as king. Angels serve as minister. Angels serve the king. Jesus is the king. Now here's one final reason that Jesus is better. Number one, he has a better name. Number two, angels worship him. Number three, angels serve as ministers, but Jesus rules as king. Here's number four. Angels are created Jesus is the creator. Angels are created. Jesus is the creator. Bless you. Um, and that's an important point to realize. Angels <clears throat> are not pre-existent like God. They're actually created beings. Um, and it is Jesus, it is through Jesus that they have been created. Right? I told you uh, last week about um, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16, which says that by him, by Jesus, all things were made. Things in heaven and on earth. Things visible and invisible. All things have been made through him and for him. That's exactly what Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2 said. If you remember last week, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2, God has appointed the Son heir of all things, and made the universe through him. What that means is that Jesus is the one who made all things, including the angels. Angels are created beings, and that's the point that we're seeing here in verses 10 uh, through 12. Uh, In verses 10 through 12, the author of Hebrews says, in the beginning, Lord, you established the earth. The heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like clothing. You'll roll them up like a cloak. They'll be changed like clothing, but you are the same and your years will never end. What the author is doing is he is contrasting the creator with the creation. He's saying everything in this world that has been created is inferior to the creator. Everything in this world that has been created uh, wears out, right? I'm experiencing that at just 34 years of age. There are some days that I'll wake up and I just hurt, like I did not hurt at 20. Um, I I, uh, pitched for my son's baseball team the other night at baseball practice, and the next morning I couldn't feel like my whole right side. Um, We wear out. And I've heard uh, from about 100 people this morning, it only gets worse. So you have that to look forward to. But we wear out. But the Creator never wears out. Um, that's the point of verses 10 through 12. They will be changed like clothing, but you are the same. Your years never end. The author is trying to get us to realize that angels, as great as they are, are created. But the created thing is inferior to the creator. The creator is better. You know that the essence of sin, really the heart of idolatry, is when we treat a created thing as if it is as great as the creator. That's what sin is. It's an exchange. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 25 tells us that that they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the created thing rather than the creator. We're tempted even to do that with angels, to take a created thing and amplify that created thing over the creator. We're tempted to do it with our sin, to say we're taking something that God made and we are elevating it to the place of worship. We are giving all of our love and our attention to this created thing rather than the creator. Folks, the creator is better than the creation. And angels, as great as they are, are just creatures, just like us. They are created things. An angel 
An angel never died for your sins. In fact, they can't do that because they are created. And created things can't die for the sins of other created things. You need a creator for that. And that's who Jesus is. So the author is saying, he's got a better name, folks. They're messengers. He's a son. Uh, they, they, they worship him. And if you're tempted to worship them, worship the one they worship. They serve as ministers, but he rules as king. They are just created things. But Jesus is the creator. And so Jesus is better. Amen? Let me just close by asking you this question. Where do you think that fascination with angels and the supernatural, where do you think that comes from? Why are we so interested in our culture um, about vampires and demons and angels and all of these things? I, this is why I think we're fascinated by it. Um, Amy and I went with our kids a couple of years ago to the Grand Canyon. Have any of you been, been to the Grand Canyon? It's amazing. We went into the little museum thing uh, after we saw it and sat through a film that talked about where the Grand Canyon came from. And they started talking about 250 million years ago, you know, and that's how it started. You go to any, almost any museum of science today, uh, you're going to have a range, 250 million years old, 500 million years old, 2 billion years old, but this is science, right? So we're precise. There's this cultural message. Uh, it's, it's exactly what Carl Sagan said. The universe is all there is, all there ever was, all there ever will be. And the culture is fighting really, really hard to try to get you to buy into a lie that this world is all there is, that the only thing that's real is what you can see, touch. It's the material universe. Satan is working overtime to try to get you to ignore anything inside of you that says, there must be more to this. That's a dangerous thought. There must be more to this. It's a thought that tries to creep up in our heart when we go to the top of a mountain at night and we see the stars. We look and we we get this little dangerous thought that pops up in our mind. There must be more to this. When you look at a baby that's born and opens its eyes for the first time and you hold that baby and you look into the eyes of a little tiny baby human, you look and you say, there's more to life. There's something more. There's more, there's something beyond the curtain. There's something greater at play. And the evolutionary worldview, science textbooks, the museum at the Grand Canyon, all of that is just trying to shut that down to get you to think that there's nothing else. But I think that the reason that people are fascinated with demons and angels and vampires and all these things is because deep, deep down, you know that there is something more, that there is something, there is an otherworldliness about us. We know there is something supernatural, something outside of this natural world, something that explains, you cannot have an explanation for, for why we are here apart from some kind of supernatural person doing something, right? I mean, think about how hard it is to believe that the universe started with an explosion of ooze, right? I mean, just some cosmic accident, bang, and now you've got, you know, a little amoeba in the water there that begins to swim and develops legs and then crawls onto land and then grows fur or scales or whatever and then starts to walk upright and then swings from the trees and all of a sudden, it's you. <laughs> Folks, let me just tell you something true. You are more than ooze, okay? Write that down. If somebody asks you what you learned at church today, say, I am more than ooze. You must know that. When you look into another person's eyes, you must know 
that we are more than just cells bumping up against one another in this materialistic universe. I believe that this interest in the angelic, interest in the supernatural, I think that that is a God-given clue that there is more to life than what you see in this material universe. We all have a longing for something outside of us. We are created for more. Bertrand Russell, who was a very famous British atheist, once said this. He said, the center of me is always and eternally a, a terrible pain, a searching for something beyond what the world contains, something transfigured and infinite, the beatific vision, God. And Russell said, I do not find him. I don't think he is to be found, but the love of this is my life. How fascinating is that, that an atheist would say, I don't believe in God, but there's something in me that longs for him to be real, and the love of it is my life. Folks, God put that longing in you. The book of Ecclesiastes says that God put eternity in our hearts that that little voice, that dangerous idea that there is something more, that voice is telling you the truth. And this interest in the, the, the supernatural is evidence that you were made for more. God puts that longing into your heart so that you will search. And in searching, find Jesus. And the reality is if you find fulfillment to that longing in anything other than Jesus, you will be miserable. If you try to find it in demonology or spiritualism or even angels, you are actually misplacing the object of your longing. Only Jesus can fulfill the longing of your heart. And if you find it in any created thing other than Him, you'll never find that fulfillment. So I encourage you this morning, find the fulfillment of your longing in Jesus. Jesus is better. Amen? Let's bow together. Lord, your word is true. We thank you for it. Lord, thank you that even as we think about angels and how magnificent of a creature an angel is, that magnificence pales in comparison to how great Jesus is. So Jesus Help us to see you as big. Help us to realize that you are higher, you are superior in rank to anything else. Lord, help us to find the longing of our hearts fulfilled in you and in you alone. And we pray this in Christ's name.